Um, my last three lectures with you uh, in the course have to do with surgical topics. We're going to start this morning with preoperative evaluation. So this is something that we as family doctors do very often. Um, and so this may bring back some memories for you, maybe help you out a little bit uh, in your role as a primary care physician. <clears throat> the preoperative evaluation is very similar to the principles we talked about yesterday in the pre-participation exam. So we can consider this as a pre-participation exam for surgery. So if you remember, we talked about rehabilitation and uh, identifying problems that place the athlete at risk. The same thing applies with a preoperative evaluation. So the initial thing we want to focus on in the preoperative evaluation are things that can cause the patient to have risks in the intraoperative and postoperative period. Those are mainly related to cardiac and respiratory problems as well as infectious problems. So uh, the initial focus then of our evaluation is looking at the heart, the lungs, and any potential infections. The other thing that we want to do is assess the patient's functional capacity because that gives us a good idea of where we are at baseline with respect to re recovery and rehabilitation of that patient. Now obviously the risk is impacted significantly by a number of factors such as the length of the surgery. So the longer the patient is under anesthesia, the higher the risk. Surgical procedures that require a lot of uh, volume changes, so where there's blood loss or uh, fluid resuscitation, also increase the risk. And then vascular procedures in and of themselves pose specific risks in the cardiovascular system. Now when we do this evaluation, again, we want to do this weeks before the procedure. This gives us an opportunity to identify potential problems and fix them before the surgery. In the, in the pre or pre participation in the preoperative note, we want to make sure we note the or the reason for the surgical procedure, any past experiences that the patient may have with anesthesia, and then we want to do focused review of the issues that we plan for the procedure and the anesthesia, including a previous history of nausea and vomiting. Now, this is really important in the prevention or, or prophylaxis for postoperative nausea and vomiting, which we'll talk about in the third lecture. We want to assess the patient's cardiac status, their hemostasis status, and their lung status. Again, looking at their functional capacity, and this does not mean we have to do a stress test on every patient, and I'll give you a little down and dirty way that you can uh, assess patient's functional capacity just historically in a couple minutes. We want to talk to them about their smoking history. And on the next slide, we talk about cigarette smoking as a significant intraoperative and postoperative risk and an opportunity for us to have a patient stop smoking forever. Um, we want to talk to the patient about chronic medical conditions, especially related to their heart and their lungs. Um, we want to assess the patient's immunization status. Just like the pre-participation exam, this is an opportunity for, someone, uh, for us to see someone who may be otherwise healthy but may be behind on immunizations, so catch them up on those. Smoking, very important. So we know based on the literature that if we can have a patient stop cigarette smoking eight weeks before a surgical procedure, that significantly decreases their cardiovascular risk. The other great thing is, so that's a good point for the patient. You know, Ken was talking about yesterday about smoking cessation. Um, the other point with the patient is that if you stop now, you decrease your risk and there's a great chance that you'll stay a non-smoker after the surgical procedure. Um, so specific uh, pre-operative uh, uh, points for children. We want to make sure we talk about birth history. So anything associated with prematurity, congenital anomalies, uh, any per, uh, perinatal complications that may affect an operative procedure. Then finally, we talk about infections. So recent infections, especially related to the lungs. So pulmonary infections in the recent past will increase the patient's risk of developing pulmonary complications postoperatively. The physical exam is pretty straightforward. We want to note the vitals, the weight, the height, and blood pressure, and we want to do a preoperative pain assessment. Again, this is a baseline for us to reach for in the postoperative period. If we're doing a surgical procedure for an, for an indication that involves pain, that will give us information that the surgical procedure was successful. If, it, if the procedure doesn't involve uh, pain, then that gives us a baseline to reach for after the patient has surgery. <clears throat> 
Uh, and then we want to do a uh, focused exam based upon the surgical procedure. So if the patient's having a hip replacement, we at least want to note that there's decreased range of motion in the hip or there's pain with range of motion of the hip. So do a focused exam for the area of the surgical procedure. And then you can either clear the patient or you can have the patient come back later if you've identified a problem. So for example, the patient comes in, their blood pressure is 160 over 100. So they are not a good surgical candidate. You put them on blood pressure medicine, bring them back to see that their blood pressure is controlled. All right, here's a question for you. 52-year-old male being evaluated for an elective abdominal hernia repair. Takes one 325 milligram enteric coated aspirin daily because he doesn't read the news or watch the news about enteric coated aspirin and, and whether or not you should take it, but he does. And he doesn't have any medical problems. So what is his preoperative uh, pre risk according to the ASA scale? One, two, three, four, or five. What do you think? So he's actually a one, so he's a healthy person because we don't state why he takes the aspirin. He's pr uh, presumably taking it for uh, prophylactic purposes, so we don't know that he has any other heart, any, uh, heart disease or heart conditions. So, so he's a class one. So the ASA class is a measure by the uh, American Society of Anesthesiologists to sort of extrapolate pre or perioperative risk based upon a patient's health status. Uh, ASA class one patients, healthy individuals without any medical problems, and you see they have a very low perioperative mortality rate. Go down on the slide to the ASA class fives. ASA class five patient is a very, very sick patient, a patient who would probably or who would die if they did not have a surgical procedure. And so you're doing this procedure to prevent death, but it still has a one in three chance of mortality. So those very, very sick patients, surgery, 100% mortality, or no surgery, 100% mortality, surgery, 34% uh, mortality. Now they also have a suffix of E. So if the patient's having emergent surgery that increases the risk, it's not quantified, but if you see a class 1E, it means that they're a healthy patient undergoing an emergent procedure. So what about testing? We all have protocols at our hospitals, or our surgeons have protocols for preoperative testing. These protocols are based on a number of parameters like the patient's age, the type of surgery, their gender, uh, their past uh, medical history, and any current diseases. Understand that for patients who have low-risk surgery and they're healthy, so ASA class 1 or 2, you usually don't need to do preoperative testing. Not anything. Not a chest x-ray. Not an EKG. And we're going to talk in a second about specific indications for some of these tests. But the bottom line is that you order preoperative testing based upon the patient's underlying medical problems. So if the patient's a diabetic, you want to do a diabetic assessment. If they have anemia, you want to check their hemoglobin. So you want to direct your preoperative laboratory testing based upon your history that you got from the patient. Now understand that your hospital may have a protocol. Your hospital may say every patient needs to have a pregnancy test before, before they have surgery. I mean, every female patient. Of course, if patients had a hysterectomy, that makes no sense. But the preoperative period is not the time to fight the battle. So you go ahead and order the test, and then you fight the battle later. So uh, again, these preoperative uh, protocols actually can place us at increased risk. And the reason why is that if we order a test, that's not indicated, we tend to not follow up on it. And so you may order a comprehensive panel and it comes back with an elevated glucose. And then five years down the road, the patient develops diabetes. And so they look back in the record and say, oh my gosh, doctor, you should have known that before. So the bottom line is order the test based upon the patient's condition and not based on the protocol per se. So here are some recommendations. For intermediate, so for low risk patients, not anything. For intermediate or high risk surgery, we don't routinely recommend a glucose. You want to get a, a CBC on patients over the age of 65 and younger patients if, they are, if we are anticipating large amount of blood loss. And also include in that group menstruating females, so at least give that a consideration. Um, no longer routinely recommend electrolyte studies. You want to have a creatinine in patients over the age of 50. Uh, you want to order a PT and PTT in patients who have liver disease, a malignancy, a family history, a personal history. Um, and this is a new recommendation. I remember uh, about 
uh, 20 years ago, I had jaw surgery, and I was a healthy, younger patient, and I had to have PT, PTT, and a bleeding time before that surgery. So we don't longer, no longer recommend that. And then appropriate women should get pregnancy tests. So the, because of the concern about excessive uh, preoperative testing, the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, uh, got together with a consensus panel in 2014, and then they got together again in 2017, looking at EK, preoperative EKG recommendations. So low-risk patients undergoing low-risk procedures don't need to have EKGs. In intermediate and high-risk procedures, then you start to consider it, especially in patients who are undergoing vascular surgery. So understand that if a patient's undergoing peripheral vascular surgery, they have vascular disease in their whole body. So you have to assume that they also have coronary artery disease. So that's the thought process behind getting an EKG in these patients. So patients who have known cardiovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease, or cerebrovascular disease, and then patients who have a clinical risk factor who are undergoing intermediate risk surgery. So patients with diabetes, congestive heart failure, or ischemic heart disease, or renal insufficiency. And then finally, obese patients with poor exercise tolerance or one risk factor for heart disease. So, <clears throat> so in this, this recommendation, actually, if you look at it, an obese patient with uh, poor exercise tolerance usually has at least one risk factor as listed on the, on the slide. <clears throat> so what about pulmonary testing? We no longer routinely recommend chest x-rays. The American College of Physicians will recommend a chest x-ray if the patient's over age 50 and they're in undergoing thoracic or upper abdominal surgery, including uh, aneurysm repair. The American Heart Association recommends patients have a chest X-ray if they're morbidly obese and they're undergoing an intermediate or high-risk surgical procedure. And then finally, pulmonary function testing uh, is not associated with uh, decrease in postoperative pulmonary complications, and so we don't generally recommend the pulmonary function test. So a little bit more from the American College of Cardiology and the American uh, Heart Association. Um, we know in our hearts that the history is a crucial part of every evaluation, and the cardiologists say the same thing. Because the history in this case will identify serious cardiac conditions for which the patient should undergo another extra evaluation. So things like unstable coronary syndromes, heart failure that's decompensated, patients who have significant arrhythmias, and patients who have uh, severe valvular disease, such as aortic or mitral valve stenosis. So here's how you can at assess a patient's uh, physical capacity or their functional capacity just based on history. Ask them what they can do. If they can only perform activities of daily living, that's an uh, exercise or uh, functional capacity of a one met level, poor functional capacity. If they can do light work around the house or climb a flight of steps, they have moderate uh, capacity or four met level. If they can do moderate recreational activities, so golf, walking golf, not in a cart, uh, bowling and dancing, that's a good level of fitness. And finally, if they can do strenuous activities such as singles tennis, skiing, that's either downhill or cross country or swimming, that constitutes a 10 met level or an excellent level of fitness. So the physical exam, again, pretty straightforward. Vital signs and the ca cardiologists recommend taking the blood pressure in both arms. Check the car carotid pulses, look for jugular venous distension, again, signs of undiagnosed congestive heart failure. Examine the heart, palpate the abdomen, look for edema and presence of peripheral vascular disease. So pretty straightforward evaluation from a cardiac perspective. Now, if we look at patients' risk for surgery, we can develop an in a cardiac risk index. Uh, and the cardiologists actually have developed this for us. So six variables, each get a point of one each. First one is a his, uh, ischemic heart disease, so a history of an MI or uh, a history of other ischemic events in the patient. The second one is a history of, of congestive heart failure or current congestive heart failure. The third one is a TIA or stroke, so cerebrovascular disease. The fourth one is patients who are undergoing supra vascular surgery, intrathoracic surgery or intra-abdominal surgery, so that gets one point. The next one, preoperative insulin treatment for diabetes, so diabetic patients who are on insulin. And then the last one is renal insufficiency with a creatinine of greater than two milligrams. So each variable gets one. 
So the rate of major cardiac complications based on this cardiac risk stratification, if the patient has a score of zero, very low. If they have a three, a three four, five, or six, they have a 11% uh, or greater chance of developing cardiac complications in the intraoperative and postoperative period. Um, a little bit of risk stratification for patients who are undergoing non-cardiac surgery. Now the surgical risk from a cardiac perspective in these patients is related to two specific factors. The first one is the type of surgery. So again, a patient who's undergoing vascular surgery, we assume to have uh, cardiovascular disease. And then the risk of the surgery itself. So surgical procedures that are particularly long, surgical procedures in which we in anticipate uh, blood loss or volume exchange, uh, those also will increase the risk. Understand that patients who are undergoing non-cardiac surgery do have a risk of cardiac events postoperatively. If they're undergoing vascular surgery, that risk is about 5%. Patients who are going to inter intermediate risk surgery, 1% to 5%, and then the low-risk surgical procedures like breast biopsies and, uh, and scopes is less than 1%. So here's a summary slide of the cardiac risk evaluation algorithm. So this basically summarizes everything that we've talked about on those previous slides. A little bit more of cardiovascular management from the cardiology group um, with respect to medications. If the patient's on a beta blocker, you should continue the beta blocker. If the patient is undergoing intermediate or, high, or has intermediate or high-risk surgery and has cardiac ischemia, it's reasonable to start a beta blocker in those patients. And patients who have a risk factor score, a cardiac risk index of three or greater, who are not on a beta blocker, you should start. And this actually is a cardioprotective mechanism. Uh, it's been widely studied that this preoperative beta blocker actually de significantly decreases the intraoperative and postoperative cardiac risk in these patients. Um, you really want to make sure that you start it far enough in advance so that you have a good uh, a beta blocker effect. So, and the beta blocker effect is measured by a lowered heart rate. So if you start that within uh, one day of surgery, that will decrease the uh, incidence of non-fatal MI, but increases the risk of hypotension and stroke. So you want to make sure you start that far enough in advance so that you can get a good beta blocker effect. Um, another uh, recommendation from this group with respect to patients who need uh, surgery and also need to have a percutaneous intervention, so a stent or a bypass surgery. So you want to delay elective non-cardiac surgery for 14 days after a balloon angioplasty, 30 days after a bare metal stent, and 365 days after a drug-eluting stent. Now we're going to talk in another slide about how to time patients who, uh, <coughs> who need to have their uh, drug-eluting, or need to, are taking Plavix or one of those other medicines and need to have surgery uh, while they're on that medication. Understand that if a patient needs a bypass surgery, you want to only do it if the risk of the cardiac disease is greater than the risk of the surgery, surgery itself. So otherwise you'll delay one versus the other. All right, statins. So if a patient's taking statins, you should keep them on the statin. If they are patients undergoing vascular surgery and they're not on a statin, it's reasonable to start that patient on a statin. Um, the last bullets have to do with patients who have implantable defibrillators and pacemakers. Um, if the patient is pacer dependent, they need to have their pacemaker evaluated before and after surgery. There are a lot of uh, electrical impulses that go on in the operating room that can affect that pacemaker. Um, if the patient's pacemaker dependent, you need to reprogram the pacemaker to an asynchronous mode. And again, this is something that the pacemaker company and the cardiologist will do for you. Um, patients who have an implantable defibrillator should have that defibrillator turned off. They really don't need it in the surgical suite because the anesthesiologist can control that. And if the surgeon happens to hit the lead with his hyphricator and the defibrillator goes off, that will cause chaos in the operating room. So turn the defibrillator off. All right, so what about other medications? So beta blockers, oral nitrates, and most other antihypertensive medicines can be continued until the morning of surgery. Then you hold them and resume them as soon as the patient's hemodynamically stable. Um, the exception is the ACE inhibitors and the angiotensin receptor blockers, and those are associated with intraoperative hypotension, so they should be withheld the whole day of surgery. 
All right, what about EKG surveillance in these patients? If they have a revised cardiac index uh, score of two or greater, they should have an EKG performed in the recovery room and postoperatively on days one and two. <clears throat> now the last slide has to do with statistics on uh, myocardial infarction that occurs after non-cardiac surgery. And again, this usually occurs within the first four days postoperatively, and it has a very high mortality rate, 15 to 25%. Um, the etiology of this is about half are due to a plaque rupture and thrombus, and about a half are due to uh, imbalance in oxygen supply and demand. <clears throat> Other medications. Uh, the estrogens and the selective estrogen receptor modulators will increase the risk of thromboembolism, and those should be discontinued in the perioperative period. Most of the time, other medicans, you, medications you continue right on up to the time of surgery, and then you'll start again as soon as the patient's taking orals postoperatively. Another bullet on herbal supplements. We don't understand how many herbal supplements will interact with medications that we give in the operative suite, and so we recommend withholding those before surgery and really in the entire perioperative period. So just tell the patient, hold on to your herbal supplements. You can start them again when you get home. Um, a little bit on antiplatelet therapy. So this is kind of confusing because uh, there are some varied recommendations depending upon which antiplatelet drug the patient's on. If the patient's on Plavix, uh, the risk of an acute thrombus is increased in those patients if we stop the Plavix within 24 months of a drug-eluting stent being placed. Now, the literature is actually a little bit fuzzy on this because really what they say is the, the risk is 12 months and then if they have no bleeding episode after 12 months, then they recommend continuing another 12 months. So that's the recommendation is 24 months for Plavix. It's only 12 months for Effiant. And really there's no difference between one drug and the other with respect to their risk. Um, but Effiant actually went the extra distance uh, with the FDA and got the indication that said you can stop it after 12. So 24 months is the recommendation for Plavix, 12 months is the recommendation for Effiant. Um, aspirin, Agrinox, Plavix, and Effiant all work by causing an irreversible platelet dysfunction. And so you have to stop those medications based upon the half-life of the platelets. Okay, and the half-life of platelets is seven days, so you stop them seven days before surgery. Low-dose aspirin usually continue in those patients who are on that because there's a low risk of bleeding events in those patients. Now, Pletol or Solastazol in the COX-1 or non-selective non non-steroidal anti-inflammatories both cause reversible platelet dysfunction. And so now you look at the half-life of the drug rather than the half-life of the platelets. So these drugs' half-lives are one to three days, so you stop those one to three days before surgery. Um, patients who are on a, uh, have a stent, you want to bridge with aspirin and restart their antiplatelet therapy as soon as possible postoperatively, and that applies to all of the currently used antiplatelet agents. Um, pain assessment. So we do preoperative pain assessment because we want to know where we are in the postoperative period. Obviously, pain, patients' pain is affected by a number of factors, including their age, their weight, their gender, their degree of obesity, um, history of drug intake, or past history of drug-related problems. We have problems with many patients because of language and culture in specifically uh, determining what their preoperative pain level is, but we need to try and work through that in order to get an accurate assessment. Um, the last bullet's kind of important because what it says is that if we give the patient opioid medication in the preoperative period, that significantly uh, decreases our need for continued analgesia after the procedure. So that will actually may help in many patients. Start them on an opioid in the, in the, in the uh, preoperative assessment room, and then your postoperative pain management ends up being easier. All right, last slide is on, is on fasting. Patients awaiting hernia repair and feels hungry about four hours before surgery is scheduled. Which of the following would be appropriate? A, they should just buck it up. B, they can have clear liquids. C, a light meal. Or D, a heavy meal. What do you think? So it's, the answer is B. Um, and this actually is kind of, it's, it's sort of controversial because anesthesiologists often will say, oh, they can't eat. 
And actually, our orthopedic surgeon that I work with has a joke that when he goes to see a patient, the first thing he says is, when's the last time you ate? Because he wants to take him to the operating room. So the fasting recommendations apply to pa healthy patients who are undergoing elective surgery. If you have an emergent procedure, you don't care about when they ate. But for an elective procedure, we want to give them appropriate preoperative feeding because uh, this fasting is associated with actually high patient dissatisfaction and things like irritability and headaches and dehydration. So it's not something that we really want to get into if we, have, if we don't have to. Recommendation from the American Society of Anesthesiologists, clear liquids two hours before a procedure, a light meal six hours before a procedure, a heavy meal eight or more hours. For infants and children who are being breastfed, four hours before, infant formula or human milk, six hours before. And so that's our anesthesia recommendations. And that's the end of part one of surgery. It's time for a new speaker, Ed Jackson. <laughs>